All right, we're going to go ahead and start with our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is working with developers on reducing landscape impacts. This is Dr. Pierce Jones and his team, Jenison Kipp, Dr. Basil Iannone, and Dr. Nick Taylor. There's a little sign here. It says, very sensitive, stand back from Mike. Is that true? Those of you in the back? No? Oh, it is. Oh, you think it's true? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I, I haven't been able to hear all the speakers, so I just wanted to check. All right. So some of this is going to be a little redundant, and it's going to be fast. I generally don't do this, but the mission statement of the Program for Resource Efficient Communities is we work with master plan communities on adoption of design, construction, and management practices that measurably reduce environmental degradation, and make more efficient use of energy, water, and other natural resources. Keep that in mind, please. Um, what kind of land development am I talking about? Once a developer has a plan, often in a, it's a physically printed book, a pattern book, a conceptual plan that has been approved. All the regulations are in place. They're ready to start clearing ground. So first they grub the site, then they contour grade the site for stormwater purposes, they build their stormwater basins, they build their roads above the floodplain, and then they connect the two with hard, hard uh, piping. Once that's all in place, and the developers provided the sidewalks and the power and the sewage connections, the water connections, and those lots are sold to developers. Developers then buy them in groups, by groups of lots, and then they bring in more fill, sterile, dredged from some uh, of these stormwater basins uh, and grayed out around the home. Uh, once that's all done, you put in the landscape. Um, as has been pointed out repeatedly, the vast majority of these landscapes have installed in-ground irrigation systems. And as Nick pointed out earlier, those systems are a major source of water use uh, throughout Florida very specifically in Central Florida. Um, landscape practices, when I say reduced impact of landscape practice, what am I talking about? I'm thinking simplistically about four practices, mowing, fertilizing, using pesticides, and irrigating. Years ago, we did a, uh, an evaluation of the different practices based on the recommendations that IFAS made at the time for fertilization rates, irrigation rates, and so forth. And, and express that in terms of carbon footprint. These are the numbers that we came up with. 15 pounds CO2 equivalent per thousand square feet per year to mow. By the way, that was when we were only mowing about 30 some odd times a year. We're mowing about 44 times a year in Central Florida now. Um, that's combustion of gasoline. That's where the CO2 would come from in that footprint. Fertilizers, 29 pounds CO2. Um, per thousand square feet per year, primarily nitrogen, natural gas to create ammonium nitrate is, a, is the way we cut to that calculation. Pesticides, negligible, and then irrigation. And this is from groundwater. This is just typical water pumped from the Florida aquifer and distributed. Uh, interestingly, 34 pounds CO2 equivalent to move that water around. And that's at that half inch uh, application of irrigation as recommended by IFAS. Um, as frequently as it was recommended back when this was done. So our goal is to tamp down these impacts. Now Sunbridge, we work with master plan community developers. Sunbridge is a, a project that's in Osceola County, a little bit in Orange County, and it's being developed by the Tavistock Development Company. Tavistock is, the, is noteworthy as the developer of Lake Nona. Uh, this map shows you where it's located. You can see the Orlando International Airport, downtown Orlando in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and I'm showing you Deseret Ranch because Sunbridge is the first major portion of Deseret Ranch to be developed. Um, there's another portion called the North Ranch Sector Plan, which is the red portion. Sunbridge is not part of that, but it is the first part of the ranch to be developed. Um, this is a little more detail on the Sunbridge plan. You can see the Orlando International Airport. You can see Lake Nona around it and Split Oak Forest that was mentioned earlier um, by Brooke. And then there's the Sunbridge Project. Um, 
right in the middle of this, is it the top one that's the, right in the middle of this, see that, that Cyril's drive. I'm gonna keep referencing that during the presentation. So keep that in the back of your mind, the Cyril's drive, that is the entrance to this project. That is where base camp is located. As we zoom in on it, you see Cyril's drive, you see base camp. Uh, that's the location where uh, that Brooke was describing, uh, where the um, planting is, but what I refer to as the boundary planting. There are two other, several of the features. There's split up forest in the top, and then there's Dell Webb in the bottom center, and then Westland Park in the upper right. Um, program for resource efficient communities is under, um, we are a soft money funded group. We are effectively under contract to uh, uh, Tavistock to provide services to them on sustainability, consult with them on what they can do to make their projects uh, more sustainable. They are specifically concerned about a couple of things. One thing in particular, they have three fairly pristine lakes in the middle of the project. Uh, you can see them there. Those are three fairly pristine lakes and this is at the very top of the Kissimmee River Basin. So there's no water flowing into this site. Water only flows out of the site. They can't blame anybody if things go wrong on this site. So that's one concern they have. The other concern they have is, is water, uh, consumptive use of water. Um, that Dell Webb site that I showed you, this is a fairly conventional adult active uh, Florida development. We've all seen them. You can see the kind of landscaping pattern. A couple of interesting features, though. Um, in the lower right, if you look there, this is all down in this area, natural area, kind of a, a marshy area. Look at the height up to ground level in that community. There's about five feet of fill uh, to put that Dell website in place. And perched in the middle of that is the stormwater basin. And all of the lots are graded so that they flow to that stormwater basin. If you put any fertilizer on those backyards, and if any of it, it's going to go into that stormwater basin, which is perched five feet above the natural area, which is the watershed that flows into those lakes. That's a primary concern that this developer has, is that that not continue. And so they on to a different model. Um, and I wanted to describe three aspects of this pro project, the Sunbridge project, that we've made recommendations about practices they might want to adopt. The first is soil amendments. Uh, as you saw earlier in the slide, when we do these kinds of projects, we are bringing in a lot of fill and we're doing a lot of compaction. Um, this does not leave a very good environment for plant material to grow in. And uh, that oftentimes requires irrigation and fertilization and, and, and plants that can tolerate those harsh conditions. So when you uh, amend and adjust the soil, you have a better chance that perhaps you can put in plant material that doesn't require uh, quite as intensive management. And so uh, along Cyril's Drive, uh, in the median and along the strips between the sidewalk and the road itself, um, they made the decision to integrate at four cubic yards, as Evan described in his talk, four cubic yards per thousand square feet, they rehabilitated that soil. And that has now become a standard practice in the first neighborhood that they've got, Wesleyan Park. So we're anticipating that this may become a standard practice. I unfortunately, in spite of Mark Singleton at uh, his best efforts to give me a picture, because I saw it just last week, the plant material in there just looks great. Uh, planted uh, when in the fall, Mark, is that right? When Cyril's Drive. And um, this material was put in last year, about one year ago. A second uh, aspect of this is the one that Brooke just went over, and that's the boundary planting study. Um, what I want you to keep in mind is that the developer, Tavistock, is making the decision to look into these practices in an effort to solve those two problems, the water quality and the water use problems. Now this project, uh, Basil and Patrick Bowen from the University of Central Florida, Brooke Moffis and others are, are the key people. Uh, but this is a, an applied research project. It is at that facility that Brooke showed you called Base Camp. She didn't show you this, but this she described it to you. 
That was base camp back in March, literally one year ago, a little more than one year ago. They were grubbing it and then they were grading it out and then they brought in their fill and smoothed it out. And Brooke didn't say this either, but when that was first done, we, uh, Basil and uh, Patrick and Brooke, got pH values in the different research plots and they ranged from 5.2 to 8.1 across that 400 foot distance. That was the variability in the material that they were dealing with. So things were done to, to I think things were done to moderate that uh, basil, I can't really remember. But anyway, that was uh, what that soil condition uh, was after all this manipulation happens. Uh, the, the goals is, as, as Brooke pointed out, to identify native species that can thrive in residential landscapes. Irrigation and soil amendment practices will improve the establishment of those native plants. That's what this boundary planning was intended to do for Tavistock, the developer. They said, this is an applied research project. We said, some of the plants may die. They said, let them die. It's a research project. This is at the entrance to their community. Uh, to me, from uh, influencing that developer to do these things perspective, this was huge that they would agree to do this, which they did in May of uh, 2021. As part of that commitment, um, uh, they did engage with uh, Cherry Lake and with us and with Patrick Bowler at UCF uh, to develop a plant list. Um, and uh, this is the plant list, a portion of the plant list that we developed uh, for that project. Um, uh, there's Brooke, Basil, and Patrick. And there's my picture of the installation. There's my picture of the command material. That's the life soils uh, compost that's being uh, spread. I think mine's much more artistic than what Brooke showed. Um, but anyway, don't you like that with the mist in the background? I think uh, Mark Singleton's responsible for that. Thank you, Mark. Nice photo. Um, but here's another key component from our academic perspective. Sunbridge put up the money for an assistantship so we could make sure we had a graduate student that would be on site at this project uh, to take day-to-day -day care of it. Uh, this is in anticipating a three-year longitudinal study. So they put up the funding to pay for this student at the University of Central Florida who will be under working under Patrick Bowen. I assume that Basil and others from UF will be involved in that graduate student's studies. Um, another key component to this, not only, uh, I think it is now settled that Cherry Lake has also been hired to do the maintenance on the boundary planting. Uh, that may still be slightly in flux, but I don't think so. Um, this is the way they are going to provide information to us. This was created with Google Forms. Uh, it has general information that you would observe uh, on your plant beds. That material, that information um, will be uh, entered by the people doing the landscape maintenance. So any practice, any things that they see or any practices they implement uh, will be recorded. That flows into a spreadsheet. This is the spreadsheet. I know you can't read it, but basically it is time stamped. It is categorized according to which plot, uh, what the issue was, check soil moisture sensors, it says, uh, and then you can even upload images. That's significant. Two of the first things that have happened in this um, planting that I find very interesting is that we had a freeze. You remember that? I mean, literally two weeks after this stuff was installed, it got hit with a pretty hard freeze for Central Florida. So we went out and observed. I didn't. Mark Russell and others from Cherry Lake did. Recorded their information, and we have that documented. Another thing, first problem, deer grazing plants. Who knew? Um, but it's documented. Now, why do I mention that? Because if the researchers were trying to capture all this information. Imagine the effort to understand the, the, where the plant material came from, how it was planted, uh, all of this uh, observational data that will be provided to supplement the work that Brooke, Basil, and Patrick, and other grad students will be doing on the project. So I think it's a fabulous collaborative effort with industry where they're actually providing data for us and supplementing our work. Um, the model homes, a lot of this stuff, it's like war, you know, where it's, it's, it's boredom, 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 and then it's just total panic. Well, that's the way it is working with developers. Five years they were working on this project, and then all of a sudden they break ground, and man, it's happening fast. So we had that boundary planning in place, and they liked it. 
the developers, you know, kind of liked it. That's just January. That's just what, three months ago. Well, Westland Park, that is their first neighborhood. Well, three, four months ago, Westland Park had been cleared and there were some roads being built, but there were no homes. That's where they were gonna build 12 model homes. That's Westland Park, the plat, 575 homes. The lower left-hand corner, that's where the model homes are gonna be. Um, so uh, again, Cherry Lake and other partners like uh, uh, Life Soils, Dix Height, Canaan Associates, Green Isle Gardens, Nature Conservancy, all participated in this outside collaborative, which happened in October uh, of 2021. They had a panels, and Chris Height, Richard Levy, Patrick Boland, David Wrestler, Wrestler were all on that panel. Well, Richard Levy is effectively the mayor of the Sunbridge Stewardship District. It's a little bit of a fiction because it's a town, but there's only one owner of the town and one resident, and that's Tavistock. And Tavistock appointed a mayor effectively. That's Richard Levy. Richard Levy says to, after hearing David and Patrick and Chris talk and others that he met at the conferences, what could we do? What should we do with these model homes we're going to build? He just, I think it was just an idle, I think he was just kind of chatting people up. I don't think he thought we were serious, but almost immediately after that, Tim Salen pulls together this group, the Sustainable Landscape Design Group, and on November 9th, we met, met at the offices of Brian Canaan in Orlando. Uh, <clears throat> Jenison and I, Jenison Kip and I were asked to provide the charge, i.e., you know, what are the design requirements for these landscapes, for these model homes, if we, if we were making a recommendation to Richard Levy. This is our charge, minimize, eliminate irrigation beyond establishment, minimize, eliminate mineralized fertilizer use, minimize, eliminate pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, and promote, maximize ecological diversity and ecosystem services. So that's what we asked the landscape architects to do. Um, November 12th, three days later, we got the first site plan for a David Weekly home. This is lot 58. So that's, uh, forget that, got to keep up. Three minutes, right? Dick's height happened, uh, they, we split the plans up. We had a total of 12, we split them up between Canon Associates and David Weekly. This is one that on January 10th, Dick's height brought back with that site information that we had. And there's the plant list that she, uh, and working with Cherry Lake used. That's not, that is not complete. There were more than those. Um, interestingly, um, if we were gonna plant that landscape, Richard Levy says, what would it cost? So Cherry Lake says, all right, we'll work with Green Isle Gardens and we'll get you a price. Um, Matt uh, McDermott said, but don't let that price exceed. He gave us some expectations of what a builder would normally be spending for the landscape around their model home. With that set of information, here's what was produced on trees and shrubs. It was roughly $2,600 for trees and shrubs, but it was an additional $1,500, $1,800 for the mulch, the gravel, hardscape, life soils, and then an additional $2,600 for the irrigation system, which we still needed. Um, so there's the summary of what was provided. So now we've got explicit information on what that landscape cost uh, to install for the plant material and to install it. Um, again, this was uh, quite an opportunity to have these 12 uh, native landscapes to, to have an applied research study designed around. Basil uh, went to Clue and, and made a pitch. Uh, we happened to have had uh, money that was uh, being offered to us from the Nature Conservancy to match that. And uh, that was successful. And so now a student is being solicited to work with these model homes. And this on April 12th, week ago, last Tuesday, uh, was our first visit since those landscapes were installed. This is brand new material, a brand new installation. We visited it with several people. The people in that lower right hand corner you can see are Nick Taylor, um, Mark Singleton. Uh, the person there that's standing with me is the senior real estate associate for David Weekly, wanting to understand about this landscape and how she should sell it to people that are walking in. 
The next person uh, with his back to you is Mike Sweeney. He is with Toho Water and uh, other people uh, in the picture. I guess I'm just almost just flat out of time. I, okay. Um, I'm just gonna say there were some glitches. Uh, we provided the plans, uh, the des designers, the, the builders, some of them just jumped on it and gave it to their landscape people who thought it was a, a suggestion. So they installed some um, non-natives where natives like sword fern and firebush, they just didn't install the wrong thing. They put some turf where the design had not called for turf. Uh, the Tavistock folks have now come back and they basically turned down the landscape and asked for those things to be fixed, uh, which would support the, the integrity of the uh, research project that we had proposed to them that they're supporting. Uh, one other thing, in the same way that the maintenance on the boundary planting is being done, uh, Cherry Lake estimated the cost of maintaining these landscapes and we are now going to have essentially a model home maintenance district and Cherry Lake will be doing the maintenance on all the model homes so that the data coming to us will be consistent and will flow into that same spreadsheet system that I showed you earlier. Um, I guess in summary, this is um, an idea that we have at PREC is to create these holistic living laboratories. Uh, and these are three examples of what we've been able to do. You heard about the yurts. This is the yurt. Uh, this is the marketing program for, Cherry, or for um, Sunbridge living the eco-life in the neighborhood. Sounds like marketing gobbledygook, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and you can see though there on the right hand, the lower right, um, that uh, first guy is uh, Richard Levy, the mayor. Second person, Gina Wilman, she is the vice president for marketing. Um, so she's responsible for this messaging and their messaging is explicit. Water resource conservation is integrated into their messaging in that yurt. So anybody come to this community, that's what they'll see. Why? Why? Because St. Cloud, the city of St. Cloud in their land development code now says irrigated turf is prohibited from being installed in the rear yard for all new residential projects. Landscaping and ground cover that utilizes low high medication will be permitted on and on and on. That's what the water utilities are doing in response to the lack of water that we have in central Florida. That, you can call it regulatory, whatever, but that's the reality. Nick Taylor, fortunately, is producing this information that shows us exactly how water is being used all around this project. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see that little tiny dot up there, that split oak uh, estates. And there it is close up, 528 gallons per day. Now that's a split between reclaimed and potable water. But imagine if you rolled that up over the 36,000 homes that Sunbridge is going to create, that would be 19 million gallons per day. The consumptive use permit for Toho Water Authority is 40 million gallons per day. Now, what I just told you is not realistic. There are holes in that, but you can poke them in there. So is it half of their consumptive use permit? Is it 25%? Is it 10%? Doesn't really matter. It's a huge number. And notice that from Tavistock's perspective, they have all those other communities. Notice upper left-hand corner, that's Westland Park. And then you've got neighborhood A, B, D, C, all those have to be approved. And then there's the North Sector Plan with 182,000 homes approved. So this is the reality of the water situation in Central Florida that's actually driving that marketing message. So just wanted to hit that point. I won't do the postscript. Sorry for going over. One minute. One minute. Look, I, oh, Dr. Dukes. What's the square footage of the landscape? The square footage of the landscaped area on the lot 58 that you showed, I think it's only about 4,000 square feet, not even that much. I can't remember. It was on there. I don't know. I'll pull it up. I have some. We can, we can get it to you, but it. Houses on the small lot. That's right. But that's, that's what you're going to see. That's just too bad. One question, and it had to be a trick question. <laughs> 30 seconds. 
I, I don't want to say anymore. I, I think I, I, I think I've exhausted.